working. Okay, brilliant. So um, today we're going to cover unit four, um, which is social interactions. And essentially I'm tasked with introducing to you uh, game theory in half an hour, which is a pretty, I suppose, big deal, but we'll see, we'll see how far we can go with this. So we have three sections today. First, the introduction where I'll talk about how this actually works with the existing units that we've talked about, and then game theory itself with its key concepts. And finally, well, these are the fundamental concepts. And finally, actually developing it further in part C where we look at methods or actually different ways of looking at it beyond uh, fundamental game theory. So introduction. Essentially, I'll first provide the context, obviously. Well, previous models of choice did not depend on others' decisions in unit three. So if you've seen the unit three chapter, which I believe was presented by Matthew, uh, students or farmers alike were given these self-interest curves that, that were only for themselves, uh, the preference and difference curves that were only for themselves. So the distinction between unit three and unit four is that today we'll actually be bringing in multiple people into the picture. So we'll be looking at how two people interact. There are Game theory does allow for multilateral players, uh, should you want that, but we won't delve into that today. Uh, the second con difference, I suppose, or context within the larger series is that individuals motivated by self-interest can produce outcomes that are beneficial for society, such as entrepreneurship and innovation. So that's what Simeon talked about, essentially about Adam Smith's invisible hand. Now, with game theory today, we're actually going to be looking at why uh, some, sometimes this works and how sometimes this, this might be different and that it's actually harmful for society and how we can uh, resolve it, both with private means and, and with public as well. So essentially, we're going to use the tools of, of game theory to model social interactions and explain social dilemmas. So what are social dilemmas? I realize there's not too much on this PowerPoint here, on the slide here, but a social dilemma is a situation in which actions taken independently by self-interested individuals result in socially suboptimal outcomes, traffic jams or climate change. So to elaborate a bit more, climate change might be say the, so we aren't just talking about individuals here. We're also talking about countries too. So if you're a developed country, you might be wealthy enough that you can afford to, say, have more stringent uh, climate regulations across the world. Whereas if you're a developing nation, you might think that, well, it's actually to my benefit if I don't care about climate at the moment and choose to pursue uh, economic growth instead. And so, but, but that might be harmful for society as a whole. And so there you might see a suboptimal outcome. So we're looking at socially suboptimal outcomes critically. Or briefly, sorry to go back, briefly traffic jams as well. So that includes say, actually you, I suppose, uh, uh, cutting the queue might, might make it faster for you, but actually that, would slow traffic down generally because of the con confusion and chaos and signaling costs that causes. So just to give you guys a brief picture before we dive specifically into ec its applications in economics, I think. Game theory is really a branch of mathematics, if you will, but then it's, it's certainly applied maths. Um, its applications, if you're interested in biology, are, are also there. So John Maynard Smith uh, famously did a lot uh, regarding evolutionary uh, game theory. Um, and that's certainly worth looking at if you're interested. Uh, psychology, certainly, that's certainly linked with game theory in economics. Um, nowadays, in economics, 
we do tend to go on uh, beyond, I suppose, the assumption of the base assumption of pure rationalism. So we'll be looking at different elements of psychology later on, which were briefly introduced in, in unit three as well, I think. And so applications for game theory, although we're talking, about, I'm limited to speaking about economics today, you can certainly have literature everywhere that can talk to you about game theory in a much wider context too. For economics, you'll find that we, we're focusing on, you'll find there's a lot of far, I suppose, uh, agriculture, agricultural examples later on, but then actually this is applicab applicable to auctions, uh, the Cold War too, so, so there are a variety of applications to game theory. So anyhow, in this unit, we'll be discussing social dilemmas and how they occur because we don't have perfect information. Um, I will be elaborating on that a bit more later on. So the tragedy of the commons is a pretty famous example by G Garrett Hardin, who, who published an article uh, essentially talking about how common property or common resources are often overexploited. So what does that mean? Imagine if I have 10 people in my village and we each own five cows, right? Now, if I, now, in the current stage, we actually have enough grass, uh, which grows sustainably. And if we keep feeding them as they are, we'll have no trouble sustaining uh, the amount of grass we have. Now, I can add one more cow to my population, to, to the flock I own, or the stock I own. And I can feed them on the same common grass patch. And that's still fine. And you won't see much difference. But I will get more money perhaps when I sell the cow or sell its milk say but the trouble occurs if everybody does that and if everybody has that self-interest in mind then the tragedy of the commons occurs where your public resource is overexploited and that's typically uh, seen really and what you do find is so so people who might uh, free ride, say, w what are these free riders? So free riding could be if you are, if somebody has a lamp, say, and you're using uh, the lamp that they paid for, whereas it doesn't cost you anything to use it, uh, that might be a, a, a case of uh, free riding and there are ways to resolve this. So there's obviously altruism and government policy. There's, so those are the two elements that we're looking at to resolve social dilemmas uh, later on. But before that, we will be discussing the key concepts without any government policy involved. And we'll look at how that uh, has talked about. So a couple of terms before we begin. I'll, I'll just go through these systematically. A social interaction is a situation involving more than one person or party where one's actions affect both their own and other people's outcomes. A strategic interaction is a social interaction, so it's where, where people are aware of the ways that their actions affect others. And strategy is the action that people can take when engaging uh, in a social interaction. So let's look at the game. And I think it's best actually to introduce the concepts of game theory by just doing a worked example rather than just discussing abstract terms. So sticking, I think, to the core curriculum, there are obviously many ways to do this. Uh, one way is heads or tails. That's a pretty famous starter example. But here we have agriculture, which might be more applicable at first glance. So we have the players. So those are Anil and Bala. So we assume that we only have two players in this transaction. And think of this, I guess, as a mathematical game at first. I think that's easier to understand. Um, I'll talk about the assumptions a bit more later on and when they won't hold, but for now, just take it like, like any, I guess, problem. Now, the feasible strategies are actions each player can take. For example, Bala can either choose to grow, so, so they're, they're farmers, uh, apologies for not telling you that earlier, and they can either grow rice or cassava, and same for Anil. Now, so they can either grow rice or cassava on, on their field, uh, one or the other. Now, 
information, what each player knows when choosing their action. So in our case here, we assume that Anil and Bala don't actually know what the other is going to choose. And that's quite critical. That's a quite critical assumption. So for example, you might say, um, I'm, I'm going to produce X. Now, I don't know what my competitors are going to do. There's such a large market. I can't afford to collect the information for that. But you, you, you choose that action. We'll, we'll see how we can actually go about choosing it. As for the payoffs, there are outcomes for every possible combination of actions. For example, if Bala chooses rice and Anil chooses rice, then Anil receives a utility of one. So this one and three, these are arbitrary values that are known as utils. So the higher the number, the better. Uh, if they have three utils, then um, obviously that's that's more worthwhile for Bala. So Anil might gain less. So let, you can think of it as one pound and three pounds, right? Uh, effectively, the larger the number, the better the outcome. And you're always trying to look for the highest number. Okay, so I've effectively just explained that, um, but this works for any other case. Now, the two farmers decide which crop to specialize in. So uh, I think the two, two slides are pretty similar. So you can give this a read, I think one or two seconds maybe since I've explained that and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so optimal decision-making. This is where we uh, decide what response we do. So given the other players, so strategy that yields the highest payoff given the other player's strategy. So what does that mean? So say Bala chooses rice, then Anil has to choose either rice or cassava. Now, obviously four is bigger than one. And so if Bala chooses rice, Anil chooses cassava. Uh, the same goes for the other cases. So Bala chooses cassava, Anil will choose rice to maximize, sorry, to will also choose cassava to maximize his payoff of three, say. And the same applies for Bala. So this is a bit repetitive, but it's probably good we get this right first. So if Anil chooses rice, then Bala will choose rice two to maximize her outcome. So a dominant strategy is the best response to all possible strategies of other players. What does that mean? That means that I can stick to my strategy, to that single strategy, regardless of what other people play. And we can see, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more later on. And the dominant strategy equilibrium is where everyone plays this dominant strategy. So in this case, Anil might have a dominant strategy. So you can play that strategy all the time and Bala can also play a strategy all the time. Now, what is that answer? The answer is uh, Bala chooses rice and Anil chooses cassava. And we find that in this case, fortunately, both Bala and Anil have dominant strategies. Now, what does that mean? So if you look briefly, if Anil chooses rice, Bala chooses cassava. If Anil chooses cassava, uh, Bala chooses uh, cassava. I hope I said that right just then, but if not, uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. And if Bala chooses, uh, if Bala chooses rice, then Anil chooses cassava. If Bala chooses cassava, again, Anil will choose cassava simply because it maximizes uh, his outcome. And so, what that means is that every time they choose to grow a crop, they will choose uh, the one with the highest payoff. And then that, that means their dominant strategy in this case. And so we have an equilibrium. So an equilibrium is a point where you can assume that it's, it's constant, uh, things will stay the same. That's pretty much the assumption here. And every time they choose to grow a crop, that's the dominant strategy equilibrium. Uh, moving on. So there's actually the, so John Forbes Nash, who's a Nobel laureate for his work in game theory, uh, actually delved on this further and developed the fundamental theory of Nash equilibria. So Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies uh, such that each player's strategy is the best response to the strategies chosen by everybody else. In a Nash equilibrium, no player has an incentive to deviate unilaterally. Note there may be more than one Nash equilibrium in the game. So here we see that there are actually two Nash equilibria. 
what does an what's actually a Nash equilibrium? It means that if a player chooses, um, so if a nil chooses cassava, say, then Bala has to choose cassava too. And we will see later on that this actually becomes really helpful. So if if we repeat this game many times, then cassava rice, so a nil cassava bala rice, uh, bala rice will always be the case. Uh, but it may be possible, say, if they started off at t at, at time zero, that a nil chooses rice, and bala chooses cassava, then they might stick uh, to that second second equilibria. So these equilibria, you don't tend to move away from it. And in our assumptions, you, you actually never do. But in real life, things are dynamic. Obviously, there are time lags, that sort of thing. So you can move from different uh, equilibria, but those tend to be, quote, accidents, if you will, in, in um, basic economics. And generally, you'll find that either they tend towards, say, cassava and rice or uh, rice cassava. And that's that's a situation people do find themselves in. So, for example, what's a good example? So you can flourish, right? You, you can. So I don't know if if you copy homework from each other. So you can either choose to share your homework or not share your homework, and your friends can do the same. Now, let's say you you let's say actually you benefit from sharing uh, homework every time. Then, if you guys initially agree to share homework then you might end up in the bottom left corner here but if you don't agree to share homework then you might never agree to share homework and you might end up in the top right corner here okay so that's the Nash equilibria uh, I hope that's any questions actually because that's relatively important to understand for game theory okay brilliant so no questions, moving swiftly on uh, to resolving social dilemmas. So what we do see actually is that sometimes this diagram doesn't work out. People might have different payoffs, uh, a payoff being the number that they gain or the util that they gain from each uh, transaction that they make. And sometimes we might end up with socially undesirable outcomes. What are these outcomes? Let's look at the prisoner's dilemma, which is the most famous example. Um, now, oftentimes people might say, oh, actually, it's in their best interest if they act uh, with, here it's IPC, IPC. So what is IPC? IPC is integrated pest control. Again, an agricultural example, uh, which it's where you introduce beneficial uh, insects to eat the pest insects, whereas Terminator is a generic name for some uh, pesticide. Now, the classical prisoner's dilemma is where you have a uh, tell on the other person. So you confess your, uh, the other person's crimes and you tell on them, or you don't say anything and uh, you, you, you get a longer time in jail. Now, since we're working on this example and I don't have much time, I'll just stick to this one. Uh, so the socially optimal outcome is not achieved, right? See, the socially optimal outcome is the number of utils in the simple example, the total utils you gain. So that's six, that's five, that's four, that's five. Now, a quick summary will show you that actually, uh, you can pause the video here, that two, two is the Nash equilibria in this case, and that four is obviously smaller than six. And so we're in a socially suboptimal outcome. So one would think actually that surely they choose IPC for both, but that doesn't happen. And you can use the Nash equilibria uh, with your uh, dominant strategy here actually to, to, to just figure out how this works. Anyhow, so both farmers actually choose to use the more harmful pest, pest control uh, to two here, yeah, which is socially undesirable. Well, we do predict this outcome. So here, here's where the assumptions come into play. So obviously the social preferences, um, but they only care about their own private payoffs. So they don't care about the other person that obviously isn't always the case. And we will look into that a bit more. Um, there are obviously repeated games, social norms and peer punishment. So what are repeated games? It's where uh, you get to play this game 
say you play this game uh, once, I don't know, uh, once a harvest season, uh, once a season. Now, if, now if it's iterated, then things can sometimes, uh, sorry, if it's iterated, things can sometimes change. Uh, it doesn't in this example, but we can see, for example, in this early example with two Nash equilibria, uh, typically in the real world, you might actually see a shift when we're playing uh, multiple rounds of these. Uh, there's another one, which is social norms and peer punishment. So peer punishment is where uh, we actually have more than two players and that although you gain in the short term, you might get punished in the long term for exploiting the other person. And there's social norms, which is where you say, oh, the default position is that I share. And so the other person's default position is sharing. So then you might actually stick to that Nash equilibrium without moving on to, to another. And finally, uh, there's one more assumption, which is obviously they didn't know uh, which, uh, what the other person was going to choose. And so they chose uh, terminator, terminator for both. Now, if they did know, they might actually agree beforehand to choose 3-3, three, three, but they didn't. And that's, that's another issue too, but it's a typical assumption in game theory. Now, obviously you can change these rules with institutions and policies. So that's why the World Trade Organization exists, um, which is essentially, if you read uh, what I wrote back in July on the China-US trade war, you'll find that the same rules apply and that actually discussing beforehand is helpful to getting that outcome, the top left outcome instead of the bottom right outcome. Okay, moving on. So how, how do we learn about these, social pref uh, these, these personal preferences? We have uh, RCTs, random control trial, randomized control trials. Uh, and we also have uh, field experiments where you might, so we're going into experimental economics and uh, territory here. So lab, obviously in the lab field in, in real life, but that you might actually, it might be harder to find, uh, it might be harder to find data without any bias in that sense. So where are our limitations in game theory? The first one is altruism. Now, we said earlier that the assumption for game theory was that it's um, that people are selfish. Now, they don't actually have to be the case. If they were, uh, you'd see in the diagram on the right that Anil's indifference curve, so we're referring back to unit three. Uh, if, if, you don't, if you haven't watched unit three yet, don't worry about this too much. Uh, you can go back and watch it. But essentially, what the diagram on the right shows is that the indifference curves is where Anil has some sort of altruism. So Bala might be her friend, uh, his or her friend. And she, and she might decide, actually, I want to give some to him too. And that's why the indifference curve results. And so the optimal choice here is actually B because her indifference curves and her selfish curves uh, intersect. And that's why you find that B is, is the outcome. But the altruism, um, obviously, um, you might say uh, helping, helping an old person across the road, say that might waste you some time, but uh, you're feeling altruistic today. And so that might be, uh, say, a situation where you, you choose to, to do that instead. And so let's go about resolving the prisoner's dilemma. Um, Apologies, the words seem to have disappeared here. So I'll put this up and hopefully, there we go. And let's get back in. So the pesticide example, if Anil is somewhat altruistic, then his dominant strategy is I instead of T. I standing for IPC and T standing for Terminator. You can pause here to, to work on the exercise, but because we don't have too much time now, I will move on since we've introduced both concepts. Okay, social preferences, other types. So, so what can these be? Inequality aversion. Disliking outcomes in which some individuals receive more than others. What is that? It's like, say, when you see, um, say you're a well-off person working in the city and you find a homeless person uh, begging for money. Now you might feel bad for, for that person. And so you might give them, uh, 
some money, even if, and that's, that's really an equity aversion. So there's a difference between equality and equity, but that's not, that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, but essentially that's where you, so you might say, I actually dislike this outcome and that's more of a biological thing. So moving into peace, Jordan pieces and territory here, uh, females tend to be more, uh, aver tend to have a, a larger aversion to inequ inequity than men do. But uh, there's also recip uh, reciprocity. So that's being kind or helpful to others who are kind or helpful and vice versa. So like sharing your homework, say, and that's different from your selfish calculating moves that game theory often says is true. Now, that that's why it actually is very helpful in evolutionary biology where you don't, where nature's, nature isn't reciprocal in that sense. And nature can be calculating and quote cold, if you will. Uh, finally, we evaluate whether others have been kind of helpful according to social norms. So uh, maybe, yeah, so, so you might say, actually, I, I help that old woman across the street, and that's a social norm. Public goods games and ultimatum games. So those are two things that I hope I can discuss briefly. If not, I will have to skip those, uh, but we'll see how far we can go in the next couple minutes. Repeater games. So the one shot. So the Bala and the Nil games are one shot games. So that means that they play it once and uh, that's it. But with repeater interactions, you might actually find it's beneficial that you guys agree uh, beforehand and that you don't and that you don't um, swindle the other person out of out of their altruism. Otherwise, it might turn sour in the future. And so that's typically what actually happens with frequent transactions. So say if you think you, you're going to interact with uh, the same business over and over again, you better not cheat them out of, uh, out of their profit or their share. Otherwise, you might be worse off actually in the long term. Public goods games. Uh, actually, there's, there's a lot more to be discussed here, but I hope, sorry. There's a lot more to be discussed here, but. Where did we go? That was Zoom. Aha. Uh -huh. But that's, you can always read that in, I think a very good book for this is A Very Short Introduction uh, by Ken Bimmore, um, which I think covers a much, it, it's a more general view of game theory than, than the one promoted in Core Econ, which is obviously great. It's condensed, it provides a lot more but that, that's always something you can look into. Uh, sure, you want to know a bit more about repeated games and how we can draw those. But hopefully that's an intuitive feel of repeated games. I'll go over public goods games uh, briefly and then I think I'll stop. So since you, you guys might have to go off to lunch and there's always the material from the back of the unit to check. So finally, public goods games. So we have a group of farmers. Each farmer decides uh, whether to contribute to the public good or not. So the irrigation project. Now contributing has a personal cost, but everybody benefits. That's like if you pull money to, um, I don't know, have your street lit up properly at night. Or even better, um, the government collects taxes so you can have your own military, say. That's essentially a public goods game. Uh, really. And so Prisoner's Dilemma uh, was more than two people because you can choose, so tax avoidance, you can choose not to pay taxes and you can still benefit with your highway and with, uh, you can still benefit by using the highway or the street lamps. And that's a typical case of free riding. And so that's another more complex case because you're looking at actually many people uh, in the Prisoner's Dilemma rather than uh, just two. So that's where you can actually push the limits of game theory a bit further. I realized that uh, we're somewhat tight on time and that it's already two minutes past one. So I think I'll just sum up here actually. Uh, so to conclude, there we go. And I'll add a bit more to conclude we have explored social interactions that can be modeled as games. 
So players choose the best strategy to others' strategies. Uh, I think I'll introduce a term here. It's not introduced in CoreCon, but it's called minimax. Uh, that's uh, the typical term that you use. Uh, what is minimax? Mini is minimize, max is maximize. So what does that mean? Minimax is you assume the other person, so let's say I'm Bala and you are Anil, and Anil says, I'm going to minimize uh, your, your strategy or minimize your outcome. So then you have to think, okay, right. So he's minimized it, that's part one. Now I have to maximize it given that he's actually chosen uh, the strategy that's worse for me. And then you maximize, so that's minimax. And that's the term I think that can be looked into a bit more, should you wish. The second thing that we looked at is social dilemmas and resolving them. There are a lot of social dilemmas in society, trade wars, prisoner's dilemma, peer punishment. So you might end up with a toxic environment, say, a toxic wealth culture. That's obviously a social dilemma because that's um, you need to resolve that. And ways that you can resolve that is through uh, government policy, so you're actually changing the payoff values of these people. Uh, you, you can also rely on altruism uh, and, and also uh, reciprocity. So if it's repeated, maybe you might sit down and say, uh, let's, let's discuss this and let's make sure that we actually go back and change the rules so you know what everybody's doing and that we all are kind to each other in a work environment, say. And that's, that's social dilemmas and how you would resolve them. Uh, and finally, some technical items that we looked at. So Nash equilibria. So remember Nash equilibria is uh, essentially a stable situation in a game where the players will not deviate from them usually. Uh, Nash equilibria is where you are both, you're both going to play the same sort of uh, of strategy. I, I think I might interject briefly here and add that although it's not presented in Core Econ, uh, Nash Equilibria can be a, a proportion, a, a combination of strategies too. So say uh, rock, paper, scissors. So you might find that your Nash Equilibria is uh, that you play rock one third of the time, scissors one third of the time, and um, what did I miss? Paper, that's it. Paper one third of the time. And that's still a Nash equilibria. But yeah, just, just adding a few more concepts that I think weren't brought up today so that you can have a bit uh, more look at it in the future. So obviously multiple Nash equilibria can cause coordination problems as shown. Uh, uh, so that's uh, a quick whistle stop tour of Game theory, it's a really big field. People have, multiple people have won uh, no, Nobel prizes for it. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. And I think I will stop share now. So if anybody has any questions to shout. Brilliant, uh, there's actually, let's see if I have the book here. Uh, but you can order it off. Um, so game theory, a very short introduction, something I, I'd highly recommend. Um, that's, that's a very good book where it covers auctions as well, which I haven't had the opportunity to do today, but hopefully that's helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't, don't mind. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind if you, you email me afterwards too, and hopefully that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Cheers, Nikesh. Okay. Bye. See you guys. Thanks Bye. very much. Cheers. Bye.